I want to speak today um, a topic that I will call it the making of a movement. The making of a movement. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, Jesus says, Also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The global church of Jesus Christ, the global church of the Lord Jesus Christ is thriving, is moving, and is advancing. We know that when the dragon deceived our parents, Adam and Eve, he gained mastery and rulership over the planet. But right there in the garden, God gave a prophetic word. And he said this, that a seed of a woman will bruise the head of a snake. The seed of a woman has to be Christ because a woman doesn't have a seed. A man has a seed. So it speaks of a virgin birth that will happen, that will have a cosmic conflict with the reign of a dragon. On the cross, it wasn't just our redemption that was purchased where the wrath of God was satisfied. On the cross was a fatal, deadly blow to the head of a snake, where now his power and his domain is broken over the planet. He still rules over the planet, but he is a defeated foe. Jesus says, all the authority is mine. Now go and bring the nations to me. Now and go push back against the paganism, against the principalities, against the wicked schemes. Now you have the green light in the realm of the spirit as the church of Jesus Christ, you're not a country club, you're not a social club, you in the realm of the spirit got a legal jurisdiction to push back against the domain of a dragon. And that's what the church did. Grassroots movement, without political sponsorships, without politicians sponsoring the church. They were driving out demons, healing the sick, pushing back against the onslaught of evil in Roman Empire. And within 300 years, without Google nonprofit status, Google giving them $10,000 a month to spend on ads, without Facebook, without Instagram, without mailers, without church buildings, without cathedrals, without education, with the precious anointing of the Holy Spirit ministering to the people, meeting in houses and preaching the gospel, the grip of paganism was broken over one of the largest empires known to the world at that time. When Saint Augustine came into the being on the surface of the church history, he brought so much blessing to the way of thinking, helped to formulate our theology as Christians, but he also brought a little bit of damage. A little bit of damage that he brought into it is he took the understanding of God's sovereignty and stretched it so far as to almost present a worldview to a church that is like one theologian calls it blueprint worldview where God is sovereign over the planet and God does what He wills and everything that happens on this earth is a direct result of God's will. Now at first it sounds all good and dandy until the problem is that on the background of it, it plants a seed of resignation instead of revolt. It places confusion in people's minds whether do I pray for sickness to be healed? What if it's God's will? Christians become confused now. Is evil something I fight against or something I ask God for strength to endure? When Hitler rose against Europe, do we rise against it or do we go in hiding hoping it, he will run out of steam and end his evil onslaught against the human race? But you must understand one thing, Jesus and the early church fathers presented a view of the Christianity and church that was 
warfare worldview. That God is at war with evil. God doesn't will evil. Jesus healed the sick because God is at war with sickness. God doesn't endorse it. Jesus stopped the storms because God didn't cause it. Evil did. Jesus raised the dead because God is at war against death. Jesus drove out unclean spirits because God is at war against oppression and depression. So in Jesus we see a perfect image of good fighting against evil. Evil is clearly defined and good is clearly defined. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Whatever is not good and perfect, God is at war with. Behind that which is not good and perfect is a force of evil that seeks to run rampant on this planet. Jesus came to give a deadly fatal blow to the head of a dragon that is behind the evil schemes on this planet. His head is wounded but Jesus paid a dear price for that kind of victory. After his death on the cross things changed in the spirit realm. The evil's power was broken but the evil's presence was not eradicated. Therefore Jesus empowers his followers and he says I'm giving you green light to push back against the evil on this planet. We're not living in a pink fantasy where we believe that we will be able to remove all of the evil and that we will be able to get rid of the devil. We still know the antichrist is going to come. False prophet is going to come. The bad days are going to come but we do know that we have certain jurisdiction on this earth as God image barriers to push back against the onslaught of evil on the planet God created for his people. After Jesus' death on the cross, things changed. We're no longer casualties of evil, we are at war with it. We are no longer hunted, we the hunters. We're no longer hiding in resignation. We are rising in revolt. We're not confused on who God is. The picture of God is Jesus. You ever want to see a photo of God? Look at Jesus. If you ever want to know if God heals, look at Jesus. If you ever want to know if God endorses natural disasters, look at Jesus. Jesus is the picture of God. Now Jesus creates something in his departure, what we call today the church. I find it interesting that his first reference to the church which is ecclesia, an assembly, he right away inserts that the church specific designation and position will be next to the portal to the underworld. Now when we read this or when we see this verse, most of us because we are not in that area where Jesus spoke this in, we don't understand the context of it. So I want to just kind of bring that little bit into our understanding. Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a city that was about 20 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. This is not where Jesus usually did his ministry. I find it interesting that to ask a question of his followers, who do you say I am? Who do people say I am? Jesus takes a field trip for a long time. 20 miles of walking is not a 15 minute drive. He takes a field trip and goes to Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, goes to this particular place and in that place he asked them the question. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of understanding of why that place matters and how it connects to the spiritual warfare that the church is to participate in on this earth. The entire region next to the Mount Hermon. So this city was actually located on the side of Mount Hermon. That entire region is to be believed it was a bedrock of Nephilim, the ground zero for Genesis 6 
rebellion. In Enoch 6.6, Enoch describes, now it's not an inspired book, but it's still one of those books that some early church fathers refer to. We don't draw theology from that, but we still can reference to it in understanding certain things. Enoch says that the Mount Hermon is where those sons of God who slept with the daughters of men, that's where that rebellion, that's where the birth of the Nephilims happened. It's almost like this place was marked for a demonic pagan activity. Phoenicians believed that Mount Hermon was the mountain of Baal or Baal. Towns in fact in that area is called Baal Gad and Baal Hermon. All connected to the worship of a Canaanite deity Baal. In fact they believed that whole mountain it was like his mountain Sinai. So Nephilims, the uh, Phoenicians, they believed that it belonged to their god Baal. The Canaanites described Mount Hermon as the realm of the dead, a gateway to the underworld. Water flowed from the rocks and it, go, it went straight into the cave. They would dump their prisoners and dead goats into that water and they believed it went straight into the abyss and it satisfied deities living in the abyss through the sacrifice of people. And so they would practice idolatry, orgies and different things to invoke the presence of these deities. This place in a biblical geography, spiritual geography matters so much to every pagan empire that lived near or on this territory. When Alexander the Great conquered a lot of known world, interestingly, he renames that place in honor of his god Pan. And he builds a shrine right in that place for a new deity, but honestly it's the same demon, he's just changed the names. It's the same principality, he's just changed the names. Ancient world looked to that place as a portal into the underworld. And these ideas they had, these were not fallacies. These were spiritual beings that these nations worshipped. Alexander the Great started to present this deity, the God of Pan. Then Romans came in and they took that religion to another level. They reinforced more temples that were built. They excavated 14 pagan temples on that site. That place was a bedrock of witchcraft. It was the Mecca of the spiritual activity of invisible realm. I find it interesting. It's to that place Jesus takes a field trip. Right by the open portal to the underworld right to the place that is believed to have the key to another realm. Jesus takes his disciples and says, who do you say I am? Who do people say I am? And the moment Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says, and some theologians agree, he actually pointed to the Mount Hermon, even though that's debatable, and said on this rock, meaning right at this place, pretty much next door, to hell. Guess what I'm going to be building my church? At the gates of underworld. Why? Because Jesus is planning full-blown invasion. Christianity is not a peaceable religion. It's a militant religion. No, not by might and not by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. We don't wrestle with, against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against underworld. We wrestle against the dragons. We wrestle against scorpions and snakes. We wrestle against principalities, powers and thrones. Our war, our conflict is with spirits that rule our governments. It's with entities controlling ideologies in our generations. 
it's the demons that drive our government to sign a referendum that gives permission for children to be mutilated by our tax dollars to provide a shelter for that. It's against the spirits behind that. What I find fascinating is instead of presenting a church as a Disneyland, Jesus describes a church and he says, on this rock, on this revelation that I'm the Son of God, I will build my church. And then Jesus says this, and the gates of Hades, which was believed that that cave over there was the gate into the underworld, into the abyss, into that realm. And Jesus says that gate will not stand. Gates don't fight. Gates guard. That means Satan has a well-structured and well-protected kingdom. He has layers of demons, principalities, curses and strongholds to guard his domain. And Jesus says, what I am building is right next to Hades. What I am building is right next to the portal into the underworld. And he says, this bunch of people are going to be not only a church, ecclesia, they will be a militant band that will go into the gates, storm the gates of the underworld. Because they're after its plunder. Whatever those gates are protecting, my group of people are after. They're after healing, they're after deliverance, they're after souls, they're after young people. They are after revival. The gates of Hades are holding something back. And the church I'm building will be aggressive, advancing and pushing against the gates. That is Jesus' version of a church. It's not a Disney church. It's the allies landing on Normandy Beach, seeking to stop Hitler. If the allies would not resist Hitler's onslaught, Hitler would have ruled the world by now. Evil must be stopped. It does not run out of fuel because it's fueled by Hades itself. It's fueled by the underworld. If we think the evil in our generation right now will run out of steam, we are wrong. Why? Because who fuels evil is the underworld, is the dragon. He puts the fuel on it. That's why Hitler had to be stopped. That's why evil in our world cannot stop by itself unless somebody storms the gates. I'm giving you a backdrop of the ministry of deliverance. We are soldiers, not slaves. Life is more like a Normandy beach, not a Disney vacation. The church is not a cruise ship, it's a warship. It's not a place for entertainment, it's the place for deliverance. It's the place for freedom. It's the place where darkness and light clash. It's when there is a cosmic conflict that happens and people are aware of it and people see it. It's incredible how many ex-New Agers, spiritualists on YouTube now who have a massive following, who have not been brainwashed yet by the progressive agenda and this woke, crazy, stupid stuff that is happening in our culture, who started to come out and say this, we believe in the presence of evil. We didn't believe in God. But it seems like the only faith that explains what is happening that seems to be more supernatural than real is the Christian faith. And we believe it's the war of evil against good. And I'm listening to some of these YouTubers who literally have one inch of theology, but it's way deeper than some pastors with more degrees than a Fahrenheit. World we live in is spiritual. We must understand not only is spiritual, this world is at war. Make no mistake. When we train our members that Christian life is a beautiful vacation, 
they get shocked with tribulation. The same way as if you go to a Disney vacation and you have bad service, you get upset. Because you're expecting to have fun and there you have inconvenience. You file complaints and if you're very wealthy, you make a lot of noise or you hire a lawyer and you demand money back. Now, if you end up on the Normandy beach trying to stop Hitler and you have inconvenience, you take it as part of your assignment. And any good thing that happens on the Normandy beach is taken with the gratitude, not entitlement. And when you have good things happen, you say, I am so great. Today was not the day where my head got chopped off. And bad things you take as part of the package of your defeat against evil. If we don't teach spiritual warfare, we don't have a legitimate biblical theological explanation for evil. Then what we do is we go with Saint Augustine and begin to blame it all on God and say it is God who causes the evil for a mysterious purpose and will he doesn't tell us. And we're confused because it seems like God and the devil is the same. Who is God then? Who is the devil? Why does God find pleasure in children being abused, in people being killed? If this God, then what, what is the difference? No, he does it all for his glory. For some reason he doesn't tell you until you die. And we confuse our people. So what we want to encourage us is to take the Bible and to see that the Bible is the only book on the planet that separates the world into two kingdoms. And it shows the light and it shows the darkness. It pulls the veil from the darkness and reveals to us a dragon. It exposes his will, it exposes his strategies and it gives us the tools and his Achilles heel where we can hit it and where we can experience victory. The church Jesus is building is not a country club. He's building a worship. He says on this rock I will build a church next to the Hades, next to the underworld, next to that place that is considered by the ancient people as the place of a portal between two realms. And Jesus says right there is going to be the location of my congregation. They're the only ones who can put up a fight and win. I want to tell you something that our church, the church of Jesus Christ is a force to be reckoned with. Oh, on the earth right now, the tide has turned. Since the days of Jesus, the kingdom of God has been advancing. The tide of war has turned. Since the days of Jesus, there is a beginning of Satan's end. The beginning of the devil's end has started. There is a countdown clock and it started. Jesus' death started the beginning of Satan's end. And what we are doing today as a Christian church, local churches, is a part of this global thing we are assaulting, sabotaging the plans of that dragon whose end is near. Whose end, we read the book, is very close. I know things are dark and they might get darker. But please understand, Satan is on a borrowed time. His end has been determined. His plans have been announced by God. The God says His plans will fail. Whatever the government is doing, they're just pets controlled by the spiritual realm. Whatever is spreading in our culture, they're just simply puppets of somebody pulling the strings. And we have our eyes fixed on that dragon and we know one thing he is on the borrowed time the beginning of his hand started 2000 years ago every moment every year every month he's coming closer to his end therefore it arms us with confidence faith 
to keep on storming the gates of the underworld. The same way Joshua stormed the walls of Jericho. And let nothing stop us for claiming the nations for the one who died for them. And his name is Jesus Christ. Can somebody say Amen. Now, that is a global church. It's advancing. It's pushing against the kingdom of darkness. There's a momentum in the global church. We may not see that in America, but trust me, global church is not American church. It's Jesus' church. And there's way more people that are serving Jesus around the world that are not just in America. There's a push against the kingdom of darkness happening everywhere by a church of Jesus Christ. Amen. But I want to bring this right now locally. How do we turn the tide in our church? So his church already has the tide churned by his death. We cannot contribute to that. We can be recipients of that. Jesus already declared the position of his church. He prof prophesied that the church will be storming gates, means church will be very aggressive to claim territory for Christ. And he already said that the gates will not be able to stop the church. So that's a prophetic word. That's a promise. That's already a tide turned in our favor. But when it comes to our church, it's possible not to have momentum. The tide didn't turn in the favor of the cause of Christ in our local church. Attendance dropped. Giving dropped. The interest in service dropped. Leaders seem to leave. The morale, the excitement for the cause of Christ, the drive, the vision seem to be unexistent. What do you do when the local church we are a part of is a part of the global mission that sees generally a move. The tide has turned, but the local ones it seems like there's just a grind. There's no grace. There is just no momentum. What do we do then? I'm going to go with you to 1 Samuel chapter 14. I want you to open your scriptures with me. 1 Samuel chapter 14. And this is what my prayer today and our impartation is going to be for. Is that God will turn the tide into our local churches. The making of a movement. Jonathan chapter, excuse me, Jonathan. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14. It talks about... Jonathan, but I'm going to read verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us get over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. Saul at one time had momentum. There was grace, miracles, supernatural move of God. Now he lost that. Saul in verse 1 is sitting under a tree with 600 soldiers. In chapter 13 it tells us Philistines didn't let them have swords. So they were not armed. Men of Israel are switching sides from Israel to the Philistines because Philistines got the momentum. The army of Israel is demoralized. Their numbers shrunk. Resources are reduced. Weapons are not there except Saul and Jonathan. Things are at all time low. This is not a good time to be an Israelite. Everything is bad. The morale is down. Momentum is not there. And I want you to see, and that's what I'm going to share with you today, with us today. One man starts something that becomes a momentum, becomes a movement, and has God moving. Maybe today you see that in your church. Numbers are shrinking. Resources are not there. The morale has fell. And this is not something that happened just after Easter. This is something that's been happening as long as you can remember. Maybe you're even sitting here and you're considering if God really called you to pastor a church. Maybe you left a business and you say, I am better at that than at the local church. Or maybe somebody else should just do it. 
Maybe there's no momentum in the church anymore. No salvations, no miracles, no healings. And you're, you're glad that Jesus' kingdom is moving forward. But the local church, the expression of that kingdom on the local level is not seeing momentum. It's like Saul. Leaders are sitting under trees. People are switching sides. People are scared to death. There is no vision. There's no tools. There's no anointing. And there's no momentum. What should you do? Maybe you're here today and you feel like you're blaming your pastor. Well, my pastor is the one that is just like Saul. He doesn't have a vision. He, he seems like he lost his edge. And should I just be switching churches? Can I even do anything in my church to bring about revival? Because it all has to go from the head. Well, today I have a message for you. And I really believe in my spirit that this is the message and the word for somebody and some pastors in this room. Take a few thoughts. Draw a few thoughts down. The first thing that I wanted to highlight and that is this. That God does not want you to be a monument of what He did in the past. He wants you to become a movement of what He's doing right now. God does not want us to be monuments of past revivals, past movements, or something that did not happen. God wants to create a movement right now. In our churches, can somebody say amen? amen? Heaven wants to create a movement. And we must be careful that we don't build monuments. God wants to create a movement in our church. But there's one thing about movements. You cannot build a movement if you don't have monument. If you, if you don't have first momentum. If there is no momentum in the church, there could be no movement. What actually many people call the move of God I'm going to give you a very simple word, is momentum. What happens when the church has momentum? Giving goes up, attendance increases, people are excited about the church, people are excited about serving, and we call that revival. But in another word, what that is, is a momentum that is happening in the church. So the question today is how do we get momentum back in the church? There's some practical things, but there's also some spiritual things. First understand, heaven is interested that your church has momentum. Because heaven knows you cannot be a movement without a momentum. And God ordained a church of Jesus Christ to have a movement against the gates. You can't be a movement if you don't have momentum. Heaven is invested that every local church has a movement. Amen. The second thing is heaven responds to a move of faith. Jonathan was moving. A move of faith sparks momentum. A lot of times what we do when there is no momentum is we rely too much on feelings. I want you to see what Jonathan did. He did not ask permission. Let me say that again. Jonathan was not the guy in charge. Jonathan was not the senior pastor. He was the associate youth pastor. So there's a youth pastor and there's the associate youth pastor. His daddy was the big guy who couldn't make up a decision, was indecisive, fearful, and scared. Jonathan, the Bible says, did not ask his father. Why? Because if sometimes if you want to start a spark, committees will kill it. Board meetings will squash it. Denomination will extinguish it. So what should you say? Rebel? It's better to ask for sorry later. In some cases. When God stirs your heart and you're sick and tired of not seeing a momentum, you're sick and tired of everybody sitting under the trees, numbers shrinking, and there's holy dissatisfaction that hits your heart. Sometimes you don't need another committing meeting because God doesn't work through committees. He works through people, individuals. And sometimes through one individual who gets a little bit sick and tired, and instead of blaming Saul, they take responsibility and they say, listen, let me go and slay some uncircumcised Philistines. You don't need many people. Oh, if our church, no, if you. 
If my pastor, if you, Jonathan didn't say, if only Saul, he says to his armor bearer, would you go with me? Not majority, not half of the pastoral team. If everybody could just rally around. No, can you rally one person who carries your dissatisfaction and go with them? Who is that person? It's somebody who shares your faith, not your past. Everybody in the church shares our history. There's only few that will share our destiny. And what we tend to do is everyone who shares our history convince them to be the people who will be in our future. Jonathan did not convince anybody except one man. He only probed with the question, said, if I were to get killed today, would you get killed with me? He said, yes, sir. He says, we go. It's really what he asked him. It was a suicide, reckless mission. He did not convince everyone in his past. He only convinced one person who wanted to share in his future. Pastors, I want to challenge you today that the spark in your church and revival is not going to happen by naysayers, backbiters, and traitors. It's going to happen not by people who were in your past. Not everybody who's with you now will be with you later. Find that one person. Find those two people. It doesn't have to be a multitude. It could be one or two and you say, listen, I will stay with you and with you we will go into the future and make a movement. Make a movement. We will make a move. We will have a momentum. Vlad. I want to rally everyone. If you rally everyone, you will lose the move of the Spirit inside of you. They will talk you out of it. They will convince you out of it. If you will try to get everybody's approval, you'll get so lost and confused that then you will quit yourself. Sometimes the best way to get everybody rallied around is to start a movement that they will join later. And that's what Jonathan did by himself, no permission, only went with somebody who wanted to be in his future, not just somebody who was in his past. And he was not in charge. You can start that in your church. Now I understand this message is dangerous because it could give some people ideas and you might go home at church and start a riot. <laughs> but some of your churches would benefit from a little bit of drama because it's been too quiet lately. <laughs> So a little bit of noise would not hurt. And maybe they can go from discussing other people's sin to discuss what God has been doing through deliverance and through healing. So that will not hurt some churches. Amen. What I love is this, is that Jonathan wasn't sure God will move. You know what he said? Maybe God will move. I want to give somebody a word from the Lord. Move on the maybe faith. Move when you're not sure. The idea that I will wait until I'm sure, when there is no momentum, a lot of times there will be no certainty. You're not 100% sure. And some of us wait until we're 100% sure to do something. That's why we've never done anything yet. Faith doesn't always work like that. When the church is stuck, when the ministry is stuck, you most likely will not be 100% sure on anything that you do. So what do you do? You move on the maybe. Why? Because your faith matters at the point and you don't have to wait until 100% certainty comes in. You take a step on the maybe and God gives a sign to confirm you're not making a wrong decision. And then you take another sign. I want to challenge you. If you want to spark a movement, it will not just spark through prayer and fasting. First, there has to be an audacious, resilient faith that is not stopped when nobody wants to join to small groups. Nobody wants to pray. Nobody wants to fast. Nobody wants to do anything. And you're burning with that and you're waiting for somebody to come alongside. Do not wait for everybody. Just wait for one person. And most of us already have that one person, but we're saying, but yeah, I like this guy, but I really want that person to join the cause because they're famous. Listen, you don't need the famous. You need the faithful. 
If you got the faithful, you will have a spark. Once you get the spark, you will get the famous. Once you get the fire, you will get the crowd. Once you get the revival, you will get the majority. Move with the faithful. Move with the loyal. Move with the few. Leave the naysayers alone. Leave the haters alone. Leave those people who backbite alone. Drop them like a hot potato. Let them do what they need to do. You start a spark. Somebody say amen. Start something. Stir something. Amen. You know what Newton law of motion says this. Every object in a state of uniform motion, motion tends to remain in that state of motion unless an external force is applied to it. In other words, it's a lot less work to keep moving once you have some momentum than to start moving when you don't have any. If nothing pushes or pulls an object, it will neither, it will either stay the same or keep moving in the direction that it was in. This pulpit cannot move. It will stay like this unless I push it. The ball, if I push the ball, it will keep on rolling until somebody stops it downhill. If there is no momentum in the church, momentum will not come until somebody exerts pressure on the outside to get that ball kicked. And what, that, what gets that going, what stirs that momentum is faith. Not a problem. Everybody is aware of the problem. But somebody is aware of the potential. And somebody is sick and tired of sitting under, sitting under a tree and waiting for the enemy to make a first move, somebody else to make a first move and says, you know what? I'm not sure, but I'm a little bit sure. Maybe God will move. Maybe if I pray for the sick, they will get healed. Maybe people will be delivered. Maybe revival will break out. Maybe it doesn't depend on my past or maybe it depends on the faith God has given me right now. I can push that ball a little bit. Maybe. Amen. But I want you to notice the third thing that helps to get the ball rolling and that is this one. Heaven will back up those who crawl before they soar. The moment Jonathan got maybe faith, God confirmed it with a sign right away. The moment you move on, the, on a little bit of faith that you have, what I love about our pastor for, when he started the church, you know, there are pastors that are feeler pastors. I call them soakers. They love to soak, 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 over abide in the presence until they become kind of like, like, like a um, mush, very mushy, uh, soggy. Uh, what are the marsh marshmallow? Like a marshmallow, right? Mar marshmallow, like soft, lovey, dovey. And it's, it's nothing wrong with that. Our pastor, and I think this is where I got my DNA from. I didn't have that in the beginning. He's very militant. And what our pastor always did, he didn't depend on a prophet, vision. We, we always respected that. But he depended on faith that he had. And that faith was simply anchored in God's character and the purpose of a local church. I remember when that one prophet joined our church just in the beginning. Oh man, they encouraged our pastor with prophetic words. You're doing God's work. And then they didn't like his message. So then they started to prophesy against that. And my pastor isn't moved by prophets. Or if he knows God's sure prophetic word, he's going to stay by it. And one time he preached the message. I still remember the service. He spent all Friday in prayer because this, this prophet caused him a lot of headache. And he preached the word and he says, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And it says something, and I was so young, didn't understand much, but I knew one thing. If he's gonna say this, this will drive this prophet out of the church next service. And he said this, he said, if you're not willing to say the sword of the Lord and the sword of Vasily, get out of our church. Oh, people left our church fast. All the prophetic people, and they left, and you know when people leave, a lot of times they leave like demons, loud. Mm -hmm. When they leave, they talk. Our church is so tiny. It's like a tiny little baby pool. 
and everybody starts in town talking about how false we are, how wrong we are, spreading all kinds of falsehood. It got to the point where the local churches were not allowed to shake hands with us in the mall, in the streets. We physically were throwing stuff at our faces in schools as teenagers from those members because we were, people were churned against us. But you know, our pastor was emboldened. He was a man of faith. It was the spark that was caused in our church and it was caused by faith. It wasn't necessarily some deep great revelation, it's just an audacious faith and sometimes that faith is a maybe faith. But the moment you get to faith, you have to do something else. And this is the part where people of faith get lazy with. That is you have to learn to crawl. The Bible says Jonathan after that crawled on his hands and his feet. When you get momentum, you don't crawl, you walk. When you get momentum, you write books on how to grow the church. When you get momentum, you launch a YouTube channel. When you get momentum, you become the conference key speaker and how to move. But when you don't have momentum, you don't walk, you crawl. And it's okay to crawl. It's okay to be a Jonathan, the son of the king, but there are seasons where you have to exercise extra effort to push that ball because once that ball is rolling it will keep on rolling all you gotta do is just maintain it but until that ball is pushed somebody has to crawl somebody has to push and when I say push I mean pray until something happens somebody has to push preach until something happens Somebody has to push, prophesy until something happens. Somebody has to push, proclaim until something happens. Somebody has to push, persevere until something happens. Somebody has to push, pivot until something happens. Push. 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 You won't be pushing forever, but you gotta push. You won't be pushing without any results forever, but you gotta push. Because until momentum breaks, somebody gotta crawl. Somebody gotta pay the price. Somebody gotta humble themselves. Somebody has to fly to the conference. Somebody has to lay a foundation. Somebody gotta crawl. Somebody has to beg God. Somebody has to cry out. Somebody gotta push. Shout push. Shout push. You won't push forever, but you gotta push. If you ask our church, if you ask any church that had a breakthrough, if you ask anybody who had a breakthrough, you will know there were seasons where there was no movement. But there's movement at their end, pushing, pushing, no results, pushing, sacrificing, giving, things get worse, but you're pushing, why? Because you know, heaven is backing up pushers. Heaven is backing up the bold. Heaven is backing up people who say, this gate has to break. This gate has to break. The gate of the underground, the gate of the underworld gotta break. I gotta push, I gotta push. I got to maybe one more month, maybe one more year, maybe one more five more years, but I got to push. Because once the gate breaks, once the Jericho breaks, the rest of the nations will come so much easier. It's the first one that has the most stubbornness. It's the first one that has the most resistance. You got to, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to. You can't soar if you never learn how to crawl. You gotta push. Once you break, hell can't stop what heaven started. But heaven won't back you up until heaven sees you're willing to crawl. 
They're willing to grab one rock and another rock and fight for every square inch and push and push. People will not know the price of pushing. Babies are born because mother pushed. It was painful but she pushed. Those contractions were coming and leaving but she had to push and then when the baby came out pushing stopped. Now you enjoy the new life. I want to challenge every person who's been pushing. Your breakthrough is around the corner. How do I know that? Because heaven is interested that every local church breaks the gates of the underworld. Jesus said, gates of Hades will not prevail against the pushers. Against the pushers. If you push, if you push, if you push, the gates will not stand. There will be cracks in the gates. There will be cracks in the plans of the enemy. Gates will break. Heavens will break. God will render the heavens. God will honor the faith of the bold. Heaven honors the bold. Heaven favors the bold. Amen. Thanks for watching to this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up for this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.